And so let's open our scriptures to Jeremiah 30 because Jeremiah now is going to bring us in the midst of the, the, this tribulation time, the preparation of this tribulation time. Jeremiah 30. You know, this section before us brings us to two remaining major prophecies to be fulfilled for the nation of Israel before we go into, we enter the eternal state. <clears throat> Two prophecies that will involve all the nations of the world. The first prophecy is what Jeremiah calls in chapter 30, verse 7, Jacob's trouble, which involves the whole planet. Jacob's trouble is really the world's trouble, men's trouble, when these waiting prophecies in the book of Revelation will take their place. The second prophecy is the establishment of the nation of Israel in its land. With all these promises concerning her that are also waiting to be fulfilled, these will be followed by a time of peace of a thousand years, not only for Israel, but for the whole world as well. <clears throat> and one thing that stands out and that is so emphasized throughout this section is how the whole world is so tied with Israel. When Israel is in tribulation, the whole world is in tribulation. When Israel is blessed, the whole world is blessed. Lately, many natural disasters, the crisis in many Arab countries, and the latest news about the failing world economy had directed the world's attention away from Israel. But wait. But when things will stabilize, the eyes of the world will turn against Israel until they will accuse her of all her troubles. This is what the prophecies are telling us will happen at the end. Jewish prophets have not exclusively spoken of Israel. While she is seen at the head of all the nations of the world, she will be at the head of the tribulation as well. You know, and this principle of Israel always receiving it first, whether it's blessings or whether it's tribulation, this principle is laid down for us in Romans, in fact, Romans chapter 2. It was Paul who spoke about it. 2.9 speaks of Jacob's trouble when he says tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of, to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. Romans 2.10 speaks of the coming time of peace when it says, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. Israel takes the lead. This is what Jeremiah is about to expound for us in this section. And for the first time in this book, this, the emphasis is put on the reestablishment of Israel, not on her sin, because enough of these things were covered for the first 30 chapters. And the words and illustrations God uses here in this book, in this section, are so strong that I don't, do not believe there is another place in the Bible where the promises given to Israel are so powerfully expressed. So much is said about the love of God for this nation that this section covering Jeremiah 30 to 33 is called the book of consolation for Israel, the book of comfort for Israel, because it stands unique in the scriptures. And one also gets the feeling when reading this section that it is not really written for Israel. It seems that it is first directed to the nations of the world. There's a strong message for the nations of the world here concerning the treatment of Israel, especially as the time of tribulation comes. Let me bring you to only one verse as an introduction. It's really at the end, Jeremiah 33 to 24. Here God speaks to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 33, 24. And he says, have you considered what this people has spoken, saying the two families which the Lord has chosen? He has also cast them off. Thus they have despised my people as if they should no more be a nation before them. Have you heard what is being said? Have you heard that they are saying that my people, God says, my people Israel will be no more? This is what the world is gearing itself to say in one voice. And God has already prepared his answer to them, as we will see in our section. And beyond Israel and the nations, the individual believer will learn here that God's love, God's gift 
of election and salvation, God's promises are truly unbreakable. In Jeremiah 29, 11, God told Israel, if you remember in Jeremiah 29, 11, that great verse, he spoke to Israel and he spoke to you as well. He says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. What are these thoughts of peace and of hope? These are laid down for us in the following section of Jeremiah 30 to 33. This truly is a book of comfort for all because God really goes out of his way to tell us that nothing can separate us from him if, of course, we are with him and we made his son the Lord of our life. It is then my prayer that this section will strengthen the believer's faith. It is also my prayer that if someone has not committed his life to God and recognize that Jesus, Yeshua, is the only way to him, will do so after saying how much God cares for you. Let us begin by reading the first three verses in chapter 30. It is an introduction. <clears throat> the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, thus speaks Jehovah, God of Israel, saying, write in a book for yourself all the words that I have spoken to you. For behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah says Jehovah, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. God instructs Jeremiah to write in a book things that has been spoken and things which we're about to see. These things needed to be written because they are certain, and they will surely come to pass. Prophets did not always write everything they spoke, but God said to Jeremiah, what I'm going to tell you, write, because it is important. And what is the title of this section, of this book within the book of Jeremiah? Though it is in the words of verse 3. That I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah. They will go to their land and they will possess it. This is the title of the book. Everything that will be said revolves around this prophecy of the return of Israel to her land. After this begins the prophecies. It begins with the coming judgment, Jacob's trouble, and it is followed by a long list of blessing, emotional blessing we're going to see. Let's keep on reading verses 4 to 7. These are the words which the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. Thus says Jehovah, we have heard a cry of panic, of terror, and no peace. Ask now and see, can a man bear a child? What then do I see every man with his hand on his loins, like a woman in labor? Why has every face turned pale? Alas, that day is so great, there is none like it. It is a time of Jacob's trouble. Yet, he shall be saved out of it. Notice the two words in verse 7, that day, Jacob's trouble. You are familiar already with this chart. Both of these titles speak of the tribulation time. Jacob's trouble could be seen right at every single, in every single diaspora, right? But it is mainly speaking of the diaspora of the end time, that is of the day of the Lord of the end time, as the people of Israel will be in the diaspora. This is the seven year period, the last one in red, the seven year that is coming right after the rapture. This title, the day of the Lord is a generic one, that is one that relates to a whole group of class of calamities that will be poured during the seven years of this world as it is. And at the head of these things is Israel. Because it is called Jacob's trouble. Jacob is the father of Israel and represents Israel. And this last title, Jacob's trouble, speaks of the culmination of the great hatred the people of God endured during her history. The word for trouble, Zara, you know, really means to narrow down, to gather, to press, to confine. Like a place that becomes too small for people to live. The first thought, of course, is the land of Israel. It is so small. So small. It is so small that at the end, the prophet Zachariah tells us that all the nations of the world will press it. They will trouble it. That would be Jacob's trouble. However, see how verse 7 ends? Yet... He shall be saved out of it. 
Jacob will be saved out of it, and this is where I believe the strongest section in the Bible for the case of Israel is about to begin. It starts slowly and it goes very hard. Let's begin with reading verses 8 and 9. It says, And it shall come to pass in that day, says Jehovah of hosts, that I will break his yoke from your neck and will burst your bonds, for owners shall no more enslave them. And they shall serve the Lord their God and David, their king, whom I will rise up for them. God would deliver Israel from their yoke that is now around their neck. This yoke represents the oppression. The yoke represents the anti-Semitism. This nation suffered and is suffering and will suffer. And this yoke is intense. The Hebrew word is roll. From it we get the word rally, which means a furnace. From these things, Israel will be saved. And we read in verse 9 that finally they will have David as their king. David, as opposed to the long list of wicked kings mentioned in this book, they were not able to carry on the royalty. And this promise speaks of the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. What is the Davidic covenant? By the way, it never happened in the history of Israel. And it promises a king from the tribe of Judah in the line of David. The last legitimate king was Jesus himself. Will come another to rule over Israel during the millennium that will descend from David. People, some people think it would be David resurrected or it may be a descendant of David. And once these points are set, now comes a very emotional declaration of God's everlasting love to his people. Have you ever asked yourself that your God, our God, still love Israel? Have you ever doubted this love? This section will definitely clarify it for you. And these words are so soothing and reassuring that Jeremiah himself wakes up from his vision and says what we read. It's a nice verse. Jeremiah 31, 26. Look what he says. He says, Upon this I uh, woke up and beheld, and my sleep was sweet unto me. Finally, good news. Poor Jeremiah, you know, he fought so much against and for his people. Now he sees the end of it, and it gives him much rest because he loved his people so much. Let's just see a few other verses for now, for it is a lengthy text. Just see Jeremiah 31, 20. See how God speaks of Israel after everything that he said in the first 30 chapters. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he pleasant child? For though I spoke against him, I earnestly remember him still. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, says the Lord. Ephraim, by the way, is another name for Israel. And here we see how emotional our God is. He says, my heart yearns for him. Yearns means to cry aloud. It really means to mourn. It speaks of one being troubled by another's condition. Such is the God of the Bible. And see what else he says. Look at Jeremiah 32, 41. As he speaks of his heart and his soul. Yes, he says, I will rejoice over them to do them good. And I will assuredly plant them in the land with all my heart and with all my soul. Here it speaks of God's heart and soul. Our God is a very sensitive God with true feelings and emotion. Did you no, that we can affect God, that we can grieve Him, we can please Him, and you know, you can even impress Him. All of these things tell us that the God of the Bible is so close to those who love Him. Have you ever thought of our God really as the Father of Israel? Also, see the last part of Jeremiah 31 9. He says, for I am a father to Israel. And he says, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Israel is God's son. It is his firstborn. Have you ever met, by the way, a mother bird, mother bear, that is, with her cubs? What should one do if they meet them? One thing I want to tell you, do not touch her cubs. Otherwise, one will surely fall into the mother's claws. Here, God is presenting himself as the father whose children are being oppressed and mistreated. What do you think God will do to those who are doing such things to his children? 
He will come to them as a bear comes out of the bushes. By the way, Jesus had another expression. He says, I will come to them as a thief in the night. And notice the weeping at the beginning of verse 9. They shall come with weeping. They shall come with weeping and with supplication, and I will lead them. Why the weeping? Why are they not rejoicing when they see God, when Israel meets their God? Here we're going to see a great truth. They will weep because they will recognize the one they have pierced before. This is what Zachariah says. Zachariah 12.10 says, They will look upon me, that is the Messiah, whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. Israel will weep when they will see that the Messiah is none else than Jesus of Nazareth, one they are despising right now. And one brought about God's word that we see in Jeremiah 31.10, when he says, Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? What brought about this emotional outburst of, of joy from God to bring out his son and say, Hey, look how beautiful he is. Like a mother who shows her son and says, See, it's my son. See the two preceding verses. There you see that confession, confession and Israel's repentance, that's what touched God's heart. Look at Jeremiah 31, 18 to 19. These are Israel's words when they will see the Messiah. They will say, you have chastised me, and I was chastised. Like an entering bull, restore me and I will return, for you are the Lord my God. Verse 19, surely after my turning I repented, and after I was instructed, I struck myself on the thigh. I was ashamed, yes, even humiliated, because I bore the reproach of my youth. And this is when God comes and says, hey, I love you so much. You know, I'm going to tell you that confession of sin will melt God's heart. It is one realization of sin that opens up the first door for a first meeting with God. No one who thinks that he's good enough and self-sufficient who can come in the presence of God. As someone said, no man is rich enough to buy back his past. You can't. You cannot. This is what we're going to see. God is the one who can erase all bad things, but before you have to recognize that these things were bad. And there's another moving section where God builds up his case against all those who think they can make it without him. In there, he presents Israel's case and ours as well as incurable, as impossible with no chance of redemption. And then he says, you know what? I'm coming. I'm the one who's going to redeem you. Let's go to Jeremiah 30, verse 12 and 13. It says, what? Thus says Jehovah, your affliction is incurable, your wound is severe. There is no one to plead your cause that you may be bound up. You have no healing medicines. And look at verse 15. Why do you cry about your affliction? Your sorrow is incurable. Because in the multitudes of your iniquities, because your sins have increased, I have done these things to you. If the section stopped here, it is the end for Israel and for us. Israel's affliction as ours is incurable. And there is no one for the rescue, no medicine for our sins. And don't even cry or complain, God says, because it's for nothing. Until God comes back and says, look at verse 17, by the way, where everyone's solution is. For I will restore health to you. And heal you of your wounds, says the Lord, because they called you an outcast, saying, This is Zion, no one seeks her. I will heal you, says the Lord. I will restore you health and heal your wounds, says the Lord, because no one else came. How can this be possible since it is incurable? This is, I want to tell you, the miracle of salvation. And now, how is he doing the healing? Not difficult, right? He sent his son. Remember, Isaiah 53, 5, the same word is there. It says, he was wounded, the Messiah, for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisements of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are, the same word, healed. This is where the answer is, right? There's no other way but Yeshua himself to heal us of our 
sins. This is where our healing is for Israel and for anyone. If you are looking for healing, healing of wounds that you suffered, it is in the Messiah only that you will find them. And this section ends with the same theme of healing. See Jeremiah 33, 6, where three synonyms for healing are used here. Jeremiah 33, 6 says, Behold, I will bring health and healing and will heal them and reveal to them the abundance of peace and truth. You know, there are three different Hebrew words, by the way, for the same English word in my translation. The first one, health, is rala. The second one for healing is orek. And the third one is rafa. You know, put together, these words do not leave any doubt that God will bless the individual without measure. From the first word, rala, the first one, we have the word to lift up to great heights, to raise very high. From orek, the second word, we have the idea of prolongation, of lengthening of one's life as a blessing. From Rafa, the third one, we have the usual word for healing, which is to make whole, to reestablish, to give full restitution. Here, by the way, is the definition of salvation. This is what the Lord is waiting to do for you if you do not know him as your personal savior. God is in the business of restitution. We all need restitution. We cannot make it by ourselves. You know, I read an illustration from Tony Evans about a guy whose name was or is Billy Taylor. He is a junkyard specialist. Billy Taylor goes to junkyards to find stuff that other people have thrown away, discarded, and considered no good or worthless. Billy Taylor brings it back to his gar garage and turns the junk into contemporary art pieces, which he then sells for upwards to $5,000 a piece. He goes and finds junk that is worthless in everybody's eyes and then turns it into a masterpiece. When Billy Taylor looks at the junk, he sees more than what meets the eye. He sees a masterpiece in the making. He takes things that are worthless and make them something beautiful. Well, you may have been worthless before you met Yeshua. But once you meet him, even if you were in the junkyard, he is able to go into that chart to save you and turn you into valuable masterpiece because in his grace you are now a divine design this is why god speaks so highly of israel he just said that they were sinners but he says look how beautiful they are because he's going to shape them as he's shaping you if you are a believer this is what we call sanctification if you're looking for healing it is in yeshua you should look and I want to bring you to this one verse that is considered the most difficult to understand in Jeremiah by many commentators. But that really speaks also of healing, of restitution, of changes in one's life. Let's go to Jeremiah 31, 22. And see how we can understand, especially the last words of this verse. I bring you there because many commentators just rely on the translations. And when you do that, you sometimes will fall. It says, How long will you get about, O you backsliding daughter? For the Lord has created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall encompass a man. A woman shall encompass a man. What does that mean? The first thing that may come to our mind is the Virgin Miriam or Virgin Mary giving birth to Yeshua. It may be if you stretch this verse until the end of the street, and maybe you can pull this out of it. But the Hebrew is different. The NIV margin is interesting. It's kind of naive, I have to tell you. It says that one possible idea is that a woman will seek or court a man. Because in that culture, a woman will not normally court a man. So this would indicate something unusual. If the word encompass means court, I would understand. I mean, with all due respect, one has much difficulties saying where there's courtship in here. We will see that this interpretation, again, is ba based on faulty translations. Calvin explains this. He says, Israel, who is feeble as a woman, shall be superior in the warlike Babylonians. The captives shall reduce their captors to captivity. Now, I don't know when in history, in prophecy, the Chaldeans 
or the Babylonians were or will be ever captive to the Jews. You won't find this anywhere. Another said that the woman here is Israel. She had been unfaithful, but in the future she will finally seek her God and ask to be united with him. This is, by the way, very close to the original. You know, most difficult passages are clarified when you go to the original words. It's not difficult, and things are clarified. The first thing that we find here is that the words woman and men are not the normal words for men and women. The word here for men is gibor. This is surely not a normal word for men, but speaks of might. It speaks of strength, like El Gibor, mighty God. It's not mighty man, it's mighty God. And how may this may indicate, by the way, the condition of Israel as she will return in her country, strong and glorious. The word used here for woman is really female human or animal and this word usually stands in opposition to a word zakar which is the word for male but that is not the case used here so it's not a question of male and female we have to look deeper perhaps we can look at the root meaning of the word female here which means really weakness as if something was broken and this word shows well the condition into which a person experiences this weakness so it is not a woman, as it is the condition of a frailty. This then may indicate a frail condition into which Israel at the time of Jeremiah was. In both these words, we can see the two conditions of Israel, then and later. As the word compass, the basic meaning of the word involves the idea of turning, to make a U-turn. This is what it means. So in the context, he speaks of Israel in its Weakness is going to captivity, but will come back in strength. Let me paraphrase this verse for you. For the Lord has created a new thing in the earth, a new thing because people do not think of Israel as being reestablished. It is pushed away. So God has created a new thing in the earth. Israel is taken away in her weakness, but she will return. She will turn around from her captivity and she will come back in her strength. This is what it is. And so the condition of Israel will be changed. And this verse follows the preceding verse, by the way, in this context, in verse 21, where God tells the people, he says, set up signs. You know, when you go to captivity, put up signs because you're going to come back the same road and I'm going to establish you. Set up signs, mend, make landmarks, he says. Set your heart towards the highway, the way in which you went, turn back, he says, O virgin of Israel, turn back to these, your cities. Israel will make a U-turn in time, and this is what is new in this earth. And this newness, by the way, we can experience in our lives, because the history of Israel is very much like our history. And in the same line, there is another similar passage in Jeremiah that is quoted in the Gospel. See Jeremiah 31.15, as it is quoted in Matthew 2. We're going to try to find out why it is quoted there. Let's read verses 15 and 16, Jeremiah 31. It says, Thus says the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children, because they are no more. Thus says the Lord, refrain for your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. Ramah, by the way, is the place from where the Babylonian gathered the Jews to bring them to captivity. It is the place of departure. This place is about six miles north of Jerusalem in the territory of Benjamin. Rachel is here mentioned. She is seen as the mother of both the houses of Israel. Her two sons, Joseph and Benjamin, represents here the northern tribes, Joseph, and the southern part of Israel, Benjamin, both taken away, and Rachel mourns for them. As we have seen, Israel was taken in 722 B.C., and Judah in 583 B.C., and this is where we are in Jeremiah. And in verse 16, God addresses Rachel and says to her, Refrain from voice of weeping. Stop crying. Why? Because they will come back from there. 
they will come back from their weakness I will make them Gibor as he says in the next verse and we know that Benjamin's name was changed the story tells us that Rachel died giving birth to Benjamin and before her death she called him the son of my trouble however Jacob changed his name for the son of my right hand here we can see in both names the two condition of Israel in the diaspora she's the son of my trouble to God also but when they return she will be the son of my right hand but why is this verse quoted in Matthew 2 18 see the passage Matthew 2 17 18 you have it in the screen it says then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet saying a voice was heard in Ramah lamentation weeping and great mourning Rachel weeping for her children refusing to be comforted because they are no more you see the weeping has not stopped just want to tell you that the weeping will stop at the second coming where then is the relation first I want to tell you that both Jesus and Israel are seen as God's son God's firstborn and in his first coming Yeshua may be seen as a man of sorrow as well as was Benjamin being despised and being rejected but he will come back glorified as the son of his right hand as with Israel her Messiah followed the same history and today Israel is as the Messiah was at his first coming despised and viewed as nothing and this is where we come to the crux to the heart of the message it is here where we see the strongest illustration ever for God's love for Israel we even sang some of the words this morning it is also here we learn that God is going to give Israel a new law a new covenant through this new covenant God will make sure that everyone who is called Israel is truly Israel no more will Israel be composed of wheat and tares in the millennium all Israel will be saved let us see how this section begins this section really begins in verse 29 29 we're going to read 29 to 34 chapter 31 it says in those days they shall say no more the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children teeth are set on age but everyone shall die for his own iniquity every man who eats the sour grapes his teeth shall be set on edge behold the days are coming says the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt my covenant which they broke though I was a husband to them says the Lord but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days says the Lord I will put my law in their minds and right in their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying know the Lord for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them says the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and their sins I will remember no more you know the new covenant we're about to see was given in response to a problem they used to have what is this problem the problem is listed for us in verse 29 and what is interesting is that this is brought up by two prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel both covering the same time one was in Babylon the other one was in Jerusalem Ezekiel in Babylon Jeremiah in Jerusalem so it seems that it was a widespread dilemma see what Ezekiel says as we find the same words pronounced by Jeremiah it was a proverb Ezekiel 18 2 to 3 God says what do you mean when you use this proverb against concerning that is the land of Israel saying the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge same words as Jeremiah verse 3 as I live says the Lord you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel and this is where in Jeremiah God gives the new covenant what does this proverb mean by the way the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge the proverb points to that children were suffering because of their parents sin and this the people could not understand why is everyone taken to Babylon why not only the wicked 
Jeremiah, if you remember, did voice this complaint to God in Jeremiah 12, verse 1. He says, why does the way of the wicked prosper? He says, why does we are happy who deal treacherously? This question was everyone's question. It was a proverb. It's also today's everyone's question. This question, again, raises a problem. But this is, I want to tell you, what the new covenant came to resolve. While Israel is seen as a unit, when one person sinned, the nation suffered. But in the new Israel to come, all individuals will be saved and there will be no be this problem anymore. The new covenant now speaks of a new nation of Israel from Israel, composed of only believers. There God says, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their heart, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. In the same way, the church will then be cleared of all its tares and will be composed only of the wheat. And he adds in verse 34, And I will forgive their iniquity and their sins I will remember no more. This God, I want to tell you, could not do under the Mosaic law. This is why he says that this new covenant will not be according to the covenant that I made with the Jewish people when they came out of Egypt, which is the Mosaic law. He says, my covenant which they broke in verse 32. So the system of this Mosaic law will be done with, but the law, the spirit of the law, will be engraved in man's heart. You'll have the law without the punishment. Now it is true that in the history of Israel, the children did suffer, and even today, for the sins of their fathers. But at no time did one's individual salvation or eternal doom was related to the fathers. Israel was a unit, but salvation was individual. It also is for all other religion, if you want. No one goes to hell and no one goes to heaven because he's a Jew, because he's a Catholic, or because he's a Protestant. One is he's, he's saved when he personally accepts and submits to the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice that this covenant is with Israel and Judah, not with the church, right? The church as Israel is not yet composed of true believers only. While we can benefit from it now, as we benefit from the olive tree, this covenant is yet to be finalized. And so there is one more important thing we learn here. You know what this covenant really promises? It promises the regeneration of the nation of Israel. It speaks of a new Israel coming out of the present Israel composed only of believers, as opposed to now national Israel will extend to every individual Jewish person. This is the reason why there will be no need for one Jew to say to another Jew, know the Lord. They will all know the Lord. The new covenant will do the very thing that the Mosaic law was unable to do. The latter was only able to cover the sins of Israel. But in the new covenant, God says, I will remember no more your sins. That's true grace. And all this may sound complicated, but the word really comes out, really in the following verse, is that God here really comes out of his usual ways to speak about the certainty of what he says, of the reestablishment of his people. Let us read the verses 35 to 37. I doubt there are stronger words than these for the sure blessings of Israel. I just want to tell you that this does not need any commentaries. Just listen to the words. Verses 34 to 37, Jeremiah 31. It says, Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the fountains of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says Jehovah. Clear, isn't it? By the way, you know, the choice of the sun and the moon and the stars is not taken out of nowhere. You know, back in Genesis 1, we're told that God appointed the sun, the moon, and the stars for what exactly? Genesis 1.17 says, God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light to the earth. He created Israel, I want to tell you, for the same reason. To give light unto the nations and to the Gentiles, as we read in Isaiah 42 and 60. 
It says, I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, and they shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. And it says also, it speaks of the sea, disturbed. He disturbs the sea. What does is, what is the sea represent in the scriptures? It's actually the nations. The nations are disturbed sometimes by this. Here I can see there the hatred, the coming hatred that we will see in the tribulation. And this in such a contrast from the words we hear from many enemies of Israel. We hear from Iran's leader who dreams of a world without Israel. I just want to tell you that this man has no idea what expects him. The leaders of Hezbollah and Hamas and other neighbors of Israel are living by their hatred. I want to tell you that nothing in this world can put an end to the fire that is burning inside them against Israel. Only the second coming of Christ will put an end to it. Israel will be the light of the nation, the priestly nation, as it originally was elected to be, because God will use the same power he used to create in the universe to protect his people. And this portion of scriptures is directly addressed to the nations, by the way, of the world. 31, chapter 31, look at verse 10 and 11. As God calls on them and he says, it begins, he says, hear the word of the Lord, O nation, and declare it to the isles afar off, that is the whole world, and say, he who scattered Israel would gather him and keep him as a shepherd, does his flock, for the Lord has redeemed Jacob. And ransom him from the hand of one stronger than him. Israel is truly God's firstborn to the nations and the apple of his eyes. Now I want to ask you what are the practical applications we can draw from all this? Well, prophetically, we must not, not, never mix Israel and the church. However, they have so many similarities. Such as God's assurance of his love for both entities and God's promises of re-establishment for both of them. And for the believer today, whether he is a Gentile, whether he is a Jew, restoration has already begun because the promises of the Holy Spirit found in Jeremiah 31 has already been given to us. You know that when you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God came and dwells in you. We may not always see it, but the Spirit of God that was given to us when we accepted Yeshua in our heart, is working all the time. He's working very hard in our heart. This we must realize. This we must know. You know, I read a story about a boy who was flying a kite. He was so successful that the kite went out of sight. He stood on the grass with a cord in his hand and bent upward, that is, into the sky. And he was lost out of sight. Someone asked him how he knew the kite was there. And he let them put their hand on the string. They could feel the pull of the unseen kite. So should our lives be, you know. And the world may not recognize the existence of God, but those who know him in Yeshua can feel the drawing of the invisible power that they recognize in every phase of spiritual life. We should, the Spirit of God should be seen in our behavior, in our thoughts, in our walk. This is what it is. And furthermore, we, bel we believers do not need to wait until the second coming to experience a revival in our heart or in our congregation or in our neighborhood even. We often speak of revival, by the way. What are... What is a revival? What are the elements of revival? I want to tell you what they are because we have to seek them and we have to implement them. Let me give you a few points on this. We know that the mark of a revival is always followed by an overwhelming sense of the Messiah's presence in our life and in our congregation. For example, if Yeshua were to physically make his presence known, let's say he came, Saturday after Saturday, there would be what? First, an increased, renewed participation in worship, right? Men will seek God in worship. He would want to sing to God. There will be an outpouring of love among God's people. There would be an heightened awareness of holiness with confession, repentance, and restitution. There would be a growing boldness in prayer. A remarkable ease also in, in evangelism, in witnessing. And all that involvement also in spiritual warfare. And an unusual sense of well-being, of wholesome. 
Well, let me tell you that he is here. Week after week, we need to grab this truth and ask him to help us to bring about a revival first in our hearts, and you're going to see the great work we can do together. You know, I want to conclude with something we see in chapter 32 that really brought Jeremiah to burst into prayer. You know, while the Babylonians were coming to destroy the land, and would you believe that the king of Israel, of Judah, put Jeremiah in prison because he didn't like his prophecies, of course. It is at this time that God spoke to Jeremiah and told him something he did not expect. He told him that his cousin will be coming to see him in prison to sell him a piece of land. Now, I just want to tell you, who in their right mind will buy a piece of worthless land? The enemy was coming, war and deportation was, were at the door. And this man was coming to sell his land. And God told Jeremiah, you know what? You buy that land. I want you to buy that land. Because it is worth much more than what you think, than the value given to it right now. It is worth much more because the Jews are coming back to live in it. This really somehow touched Jeremiah. And after the sale, he prayed such a beautiful prayer of praise. See what he says just in verse 17. It says, Our Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. I want to tell you, everything was chaotic. But Jeremiah remembered that God is the creator, that he brings goodness out of chaotic things. Things seemed impossible. There was no solution in sight but God. And I want to tell you that our God is a God of miracle. This is what I want you to know today. Our God is a God of miracle, and nothing is too difficult for him. And we also read in verse 27, as God answers Jeremiah's prayer, he re reaffirm this truth. Look what he says, verse 27. It says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Right? Nothing is too hard for God. We may be going through much difficulties. We may not always see the end of it all, but absolutely nothing is beyond his power to perform. And he's so willing to show you things you have not yet seen. I just want to leave you with one verse. And maybe we can remember that very easy. It's Jeremiah 33, 3. 3 times 3, Jeremiah 33. See what it says? Call on me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. This is an open invitation to all. Let's bow our head in prayer. Heavenly Father, teach us to be like you. Mold us into your image. Teach us to love. You are the God who sanctifies. So we ask you that you work in us what is pleasing to you and encourage us, encourage our heart and give us the ability to mature, both as an individual and as a congregation. Because today, Lord, we wish to be lost in you. Touch each and every one here and do not let any of us lose this first love. We pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you all. If you have any to get in touch with us, you can do so by telephone, 1-888-685-5902. Locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902. You can also reach us through our website at www.arielcanada.com. Again, the phone number is 1-888-685-5902. Or locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902. Website address is W Ariel Canada, all one word, A R I E L Canada dot com. Be blessed. Shalom.